Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar hosted by Rails to Trails Conservancy's Trail Expert Network. My name is Eli Griffin. I'm the Manager of Trail Development Resources here at RTC, and I'll be facilitating today's webinar. Our topic today is making the value case for trails. My colleague Kelly Pack will kick things off and conclude our presentation today with a real-world case study of the need for making the value case for trails from her work on the Parkersburg to Pittsburgh corridor in West Virginia. Kelly is the Director of Trail Development in RTC's National Office here in Washington, D.C. Following Kelly will be Shane Farthing, RTC's Senior Director of Active Transportation Programs and Head of our Research into Practice team. Shane will help you all envision the full benefits of a trail network, including understanding how to assess and define the economic value of trails to make the case that public investment in trails has a long-term net positive value to residents and to government. Shane and Kelly will both stick around at the end of the, the, we, the excuse me at the end of the webinar today to answer any questions you may have. And in case we don't have time to answer your question, or if questions come up down the road, you'll find contact information for Shane, Kelly, and myself on the final slide of this presentation. But before I turn the mic over to Kelly, I need to run quickly through some basic housekeeping. First, as you've probably already noticed, attendees will not be able to speak during today's webinar. All attendees are automatically muted as they join to keep background noise to a minimum. If you have any technical problems during the webinar, you may enter your issue in the question box, which can be expanded on the right-hand side of your screen. I will respond if I'm able, but your best course of action is to contact GoToWebinar's free customer support directly or view a selection of help topics at the link shown on the screen. And I do encourage you to copy these links down now before we move on from this slide. As I just mentioned, we've built in some time for Q&A at the end of the presentation. Please feel free to type any content-related questions as you think of them in that same question box on the right-hand side of your screen at any time. And if for whatever reason you lose the webinar connection, please re-click your login link. You'll be able to rejoin the ongoing session at any time. And finally, after today's webinar, you will receive a follow-up email containing a survey asking you to rate our performance on today's webinar, more information about RTC's Trail Expert Network, with a link to sign up for occasional email notices from us, and perhaps most importantly, a recording of today's webinar. And with that, Kelly, I'll turn it over to you to begin our feature presentation. Thank you, Eli. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon and good morning, wherever you are. Um, I wanted to kick it off by talking to you a little bit about uh, RTC's recent work um, in communities across the country. Um, here at RTC, we believe that communities are healthier and happier when trail networks are central to their design. That's why we're committing to connecting trails and building comprehensive trail systems that bring people together and get them where they want to go. Trail Nation brings to life our vision of trails at the heart of healthy, thriving communities from coast to coast. So in eight places across the country, places that are really diverse in their geography, culture, size, and scope, RTC is investing in projects and partnerships that demonstrate what is possible in all types of places when trail networks are central to our lives. The result the results that our Trail Nation projects can deliver from communities nationwide are really powerful. And this um, focus on trail networks has kind of evolved over our past uh, 30 years of experience working with individual communities and individual trails across the country. We now see that those individual trails are coming together to form networks in cities, counties, regions, and states all over the country. You might be a part of one of these projects. You may be a part of a larger trail system in your area. You may be somebody who is working on building a single trail in your community. Whoever you are, we know that you know the full value that trails have to offer in your community. They help promote social equity, fuel strong businesses and econ economies, expand transportation options, improve health and wellness of our communities and protect the environment. I'm preaching the choir when we talk and list all of these benefits. And today we're not, we're not gonna be doing that. We're really gonna be focusing on how you capture all of the, the full range of values that trails bring to communities. So like I said, you're the choir. Who are you? Who is on the line here? It's really exciting to see so many people 
um, from across the country on the line. And I'm sure if you look in the attendees box and, and scroll, you may find friends um, that you know who are working on trails near you. So as of yesterday morning, we had more than 44 states in DC represented. You come from every level of government, from the private sector. You can see here, um, you're the experts. And we are really interested in continuing to work with you to help build more of a peer-to-peer -peer network um, so that you can share some of the lessons learned that you have with each other. So why do you care about building trails and trail networks in your communities? You're all um, planning and um, tourism and recreation and all different kinds, uh, come from all different kinds of backgrounds, but we know that you want to strengthen your communities in, in lots of different ways and you wanna see the, again, the full range of values that trails can bring to your community realized. In one of the projects that we've been working on recently um, in a, a planning meeting with the full trail group, I asked folks to raise their hand and talk about why they were present at the meeting and why trails were beneficial to their community. And the mayor of uh, one of the cities raised her hand and said, I am here because trails bring health and wealth to my community. And indeed, we see that. So as a public health uh, professional, you might be focused on the positive health impacts that trails bring to your community. As someone in economic development, you might wanna see local businesses created and thriving in your community. And as a tourism professional, you might want to attract trail users who will stay overnight and spend money in your community. And certainly as a planner and trail advocate, you wanna help create a space that people can connect, easily access, connect to destinations in their communities. They can safely get to work and have fun. You want to create a place where people want to be, where they can live, work, and play, and use trails as a way to do that. So we all know that trails matter, but if you cannot explain why trails matter to that important decision maker across the table from you, then you lose your credibility as an advocate. Um, and we are going to talk, be talking later today, as Shane goes through his presentation, about everything that's available, a lot of things that are available to you on kind of the, the menu of um, benefits and values that trails bring, things that you can kind of pick and choose from to create a full package for yourself that's most relevant to you and your community. So over the years, as, ad, as trail advocates, you know, our work has really evolved. We've gone from doing trail user surveys to understand how people are using our trails and how many people are using our trails to then understand um, the economic impact of those trail users and the environmental impacts, um, health impacts, equitable, equitable access impacts. You know your community best and what will resonate with different audiences. So as you're listening to Shane, um, be thinking about a few things, and we'd like to hear from you on the Q&A. Um, how, if at all, are you using some of the tools that he'll be, he'll be talking about? What are other ways of demonstrating value that are effective in your community? And how are your decision makers responding um, to these cases that are put in front of them? So I'm gonna transition to all right, Shane Harding to give the presentation. Thanks, Kelly, and hi, everybody. It was really great to see those images that Kelly pulled up there, uh, happy, smiling faces and people enjoying the trails. And I just want to put into context that I'm going to be talking about some math and some numbers and some economic models. And we're going to be thinking about the quantification and understanding of trails in, in that more numeric sense. But I don't want to lose sight of the fact that this is all in service of all of these great community benefits that uh, that Kelly was talking about and that make the full value of trails. So 
I want to give that little disclaimer that while I'm going to get into numbers a little bit here, that's not to say that the full value is capturable in pure dollars and cents for, for these great community assets, but it is to say that the dollars and cents matter and they make for better, uh, more comparable, compelling arguments in many cases because we do need dollars, real dollars, to build and, and to maintain trails. So that's really the context here is how do we understand and quantify that value in a way that we can put our best foot forward on, on some of these trail projects. And as Kelly said, there's lots and lots of different types of values to, to trails. Uh, you can see the list there on the screen, but I'm gonna start with the economic case. And uh, that's because I, I see a lot of, of economic assessments of trails that come out and they really kind of run the gamut of uh, things that are measured and quality of their methodology. And I just want to take a, a little bit of time here at the beginning as we're talking about the quantification to really talk about how these economic evaluations happen. And I, I, I was uh, talking with uh, some folks in Morgantown a couple of weeks ago about uh, how I have a Google alert set so that any time I see a trail economic assessment come up, I, I can at least take a look at it. It means I've got a whole pile of these PDFs on my, on my computer. And I'll see ranges for very similar trails, similar context, uh, similar, um, many of them having sort of like a small town connection. I'll see ranges that go from about a $2 million estimate to a $275 million estimate for what to the average user and the uh, average experience would seem like pretty comparable trails. And when we're going in as advocates and we're talking to decision makers and we have a range like that, it, it's hard for us to keep our credibility. It's hard for us to uh, go in with a straight face and, and say that our, our trail might uh, might be a positive somewhere between uh, two and two hundred seventy five million dollars. Uh, as soon as they peel back the peel back the cover and and ask you how you got that number, a lot of times folks are a little stuck. So I want to go through the three main ways that you can assess the economic value of a trail. And then we'll add on some of those non-economic values that would be uh, considered externalities by the economists, but are actually really important for, for trail users. Now, the three main ways that you can economically assess the value of a trail are direct spending, input output, and cost benefit. And I'm going to go into detail a little bit on each of those so you can know what they are. But direct spending is the kernel of each of them. The input output uses that direct spending number, and then it adds in multipliers to get at the way the dollars recirculate through the local economy. And then the cost benefit adds on other externalities and non-economic benefits to really get at the, the full value of all contributions, but in a monetized way. But I don't wanna really start with trails going through there because trails are a little bit more complicated. I'm gonna switch over to ice cream cones because we can all sort of agree that there's a simple transaction where we can, we can use as an example an economic assessment of an ice cream cone to a community. So what we're gonna start with here is a direct spending assessment of an ice cream cone. And that's it. Jill pays $3 for an ice cream cone. The direct spending analysis would say the economic impact of that ice cream cone to your community was $3, no more, no less. And that is a legitimate uh, means of, of doing an economic assessment. Uh, and it is the most simple, surveyable way of doing it. There's no difficulty communicating to a decision maker how you assess that. You simply ask what the direct number was. But if you go uh, further up the scale to the input output, there's a little more complexity and it's a little bit broader. You have to get more information and use a software that accounts for multipliers and indirect and reflected benefits uh, within the economy. And it's likely to result in a higher amount. So if Jill goes and buys the same $3 ice cream cone, and we look at that with an input output model, we would find that there's the $3 that were the direct spending. But also, what if that community also produced the milk and someone sold the sugar? And at the end of the day, once you've sold the ice cream, you also have an ice cream shop there that's employing people. And those people take part of that $3 and respend it in other businesses. And in the end, you'll see that that $3, if you account for everything that gets reflected throughout the economy, you're probably actually contributing five to $8 to the local economy with that $3 purchase. So it's looking at how the money flows into and out of the local economy and how it gets redistributed around. And many parts of that $3 get used over and over and over again. 
And the software that they use actually accounts for the types of industries, the amount of local uh, usage, the recirculation patterns, and economic development professionals use this, uh, this method very, very frequently because it is uh, more comprehensive and it's more reflective of the full economic picture. So if you're going to do something like value capture, where you really need to know that a investment is going to uh, really pay for itself through economic development, you want this fuller uh, input output model analysis. And this is for things like uh, TIF funding and for bond financing, where you really need to know that the dollars don't necessarily have to be paid as in like a usage fee. It may not be direct spending where, where someone's going to hand over cash money to you to, to get on the trail, but you'll know that the full economic impact of this is, is coming up to an amount that will pay off those costs. Now, the downside of this, because it, it is a very, very good assessment, the downside is it's very, very hard to explain. It requires a software that uses a lot of uh, sort of black box methods. And when you try to do it by hand, you actually have to do uh, a lot of initial tailoring to your local economy. So this is something that you probably have to hire a consultant for, or you have to hire a, a license for the, for the plan. And then the challenge with decision makers is that it gives this really big number where they're not necessarily seeing the dollars uh, piling up in the bank account in one single place. So it's one that is a little bit more uh, difficult to believe sometimes and harder to defend. And finally, the ice cream analogy breaks down a little bit here. Um, but for the cost benefit analysis, you essentially take your best economic analysis and then you add quantified and monetized non-economic benefits. So that's where you get to talk about all of the other uh, good things that um, are in economist sense, positive externalities. But for trails, it's a lot of the reason that we do these things. So this is where um, I'm not sure what the positive externalities of an ice cream cone would be really. I was thinking, you know, animal welfare, health effects, pollution, positives and negatives in different ways. Um, but you can, you can imagine that you could really quantify in a full sense beyond the economic value, the having of, Jill's having of ice cream. But since the ice cream is breaking down a little bit as a metaphor, let's, let's talk directly about trails and how we actually do these things. So a direct spending analysis on trails, we want to get that kernel on the left side there so that we can have that direct spending analysis as a very clear and tangible uh, assessment for decision makers and so that we can build some of these other models off of it. So how do we do it? What do we ask people? Now, this is the true story of the world's longest trail survey. As Kelly said, RTC has been doing these uh, surveys for years. And oftentimes we do them with local partners, we do them with volunteer groups. And the thing about trail surveys is that every time we get to ask trail users a question about why they're using a the trail, all these good things that we want to know, somebody else just has one more question they want to add. And over 20 years of adding one more question, you end up with an awful lot of questions. And I'll tell you, people love doing all sorts of great things on trails, but what they don't like doing is stopping and answering long questionnaires. So for a while, we've been adding on, on all these questions and we've been asking everything we could possibly ask. And finally, we decided we are going to ask absolutely everything. And we were going to use some statistical regression tools to look at all those questions and to try to sort out a simplified version of what do we actually need to ask? Of all these questions that RTC and our partners and our, our volunteer groups are asking, what are the questions that really get us, get us uh, statistically significant variables? And we were able to break it down to a few simple things. Those are frequency of use, the distance that people travel to reach the trail, hard goods spending, which actually requires a few questions to assess accurately, soft goods spending, which similarly takes a few different questions to get folks thinking along the right lines, and, and lodging. So if we just ask about those things, we can ask any other questions that we want, but we find that those are predictive of, of economic value. And so from that giant survey that sort of grew through a process of accretion over time, we've gone down to a basic three-page survey now uh, that we can use to assess direct spending. So I want to encourage you guys to take a look at this. Uh, we're going to send out the resource after the webinar so that everyone has access to it. And I just want to highlight that this is a simplified version that uh, has a couple of different benefits. One of the main ones being that if we all use the same one, 
and RTC puts this out as a national model, the fact that we're asking the same questions in the same way in all of these surveys, if we share those results with each other, we end up building a larger data set that we may be able to do more with. So I want to encourage you to use this for your own local benefit, but also to share any results you have with us so that we can compile them together and, and have a ever-growing database of trail economic data uh, from, from across the nation. Now, when you're conducting this sort of survey, you do need to have at least 300 responses just to get to statistical validity. And you do need to have an estimate of trail usage. Unfortunately, that's not too hard to do. You, you, there are uh, automated counters that can be permanent, that can be mobile, or you can use uh, manual counts using volunteers uh, with clickers, or we have an RTC app that helps with, with simple counts as well, uh, and will automatically put your counts into Excel for you. And then you just ask this set of, of three pages of questions. Um, and essentially, what we're going to do is we're going to use those uh, multipliers. It's essentially going to be a, a simple matter of uh, average spending times spending usage, and you'll be able to have that direct survey result. So here's a couple of these that we've done recently just to sort of explain what the results look like. On the Ohio and Erie Canal tow pass, we have a counter there that showed just over 222,000 users. We asked exactly those questions about what is your uh, spending on hard goods, soft goods, and lodging. And we were able to compile that up into an average number uh, multiplied by the usage. And we saw that the annual direct spending uh, effect of this segment of the Ohio and Erie was just shy of $7 million, $6.9 million. And you can see the numbers on the screen there broken down by hard goods, soft goods, and lodging. Uh, segment of the Mon River Trail system, we did the same, same thing. We ended up with a user count of just over 200,000, and we had an annual direct spending, again, right around 6 million, uh, hard goods, soft goods, and lodging all together. So you can see there's some variation there, um, but I think one of the things that's most interesting is that there is a bit of a convergence. Trails can differ in popularity and design and context, but there's a general convergence of the spending effect in roughly six to $9 million range. Uh, trails that allow for multi-day trips or that are real destination trails may overperform that number. But if you're looking at an economic assessment of a trail and you see an assessment in the hundreds of millions of dollars, you're probably seeing a assessment that used a different model. It would be, I, I can't imagine a case in which you would get to the hundreds of millions in, in direct spending. So, the input-output model could very easily get you into the, uh, the, the hundreds of millions, the same way that we took that ice cream cone, and one ice cream cone could go from $3 direct spending to 5 to $8 overall. A trail could very, very easily go from 6 to $9 million up to a, a, a much higher level when you put that uh, all together in the 45 to $125 million. But now this is something that uh, it's, it's not the easiest thing for uh, trail advocates to do. And RTC generally doesn't do these because they require specific data, they require specific economic condition data um, that is, is very hard to, to come by. And this is the kind of thing that if you're advocating for uh, TIF financing or bonding, your economic development department is going to want to do this internally using its own assumptions and its own data. So an input-output model is something that if you are uh, really looking to make a very specifically detailed case, it's a good investment to put it to, to, to do, but I wouldn't do it speculatively. I would say conduct your direct, your direct spending assessment and then take that to your economic development professionals and say, we're looking to build this trail. We think that it's going to bring in much greater economic uh, benefit. If you assess it through your financial modeling tools, uh, we think it will pay for itself. And, and you can make that case to the professionals to, to, to do that. But a trail who's in the normal range of six to nine million could very easily see an input output economic impact of 45 to 125 million, depending on how the money recirculates through that local economy. Uh, a lot depends on what sorts of businesses and, and um, what sorts of employment opportunities are created by the trail. But 45 to 125 is a perfectly reasonable expectation for a normal type of, of trail input output uh, economic assessment. So now the cost benefit assessment, which is really uh, where trails come to shine, because you know 
for trails, the externalities, the things that don't get counted in the economic model are often the point. It's the things like health and transportation and, and community benefits that, that uh, are not purely economic, uh, but that are really why we do these things and what we want the trails to contribute to our community. So health benefits are a big one that are actually relatively easy to quantify. And I've, I've uh, cited this study by Tomas Gacci and Tracy Haddon Lowe many times. Um, it, it quantifies that trail, trails save users on average 11 to $21 per year in health costs. Now that doesn't sound like a lot. 11 to $21 seems like a pretty small number until you remember that the usage that we can have is hundreds of thousands to millions of people on some of these trail segments. So if you want an annual health savings number for your trail, it essentially can be your number of annual users times 16. So if you have a trail that gets a million users, you've suddenly got a $16 million annual net economic or annual net health benefit that you can show there. And in many cases, you could build the trail for the cost uh, of, of that one year health savings. So this is a good number to keep in your pocket and just to think about um, the, the magnitude that, that this aggregation of health savings for individuals over time gets you. It, it, individually, it may not look like much, but it adds up to big numbers. Transportation connectivity benefits are another piece that's a little harder to quantify, and RKC has been working on a tool called Bikeable that can actually help to quantify the transportation connectivity benefits of trails. It can actually look at where people live and where destinations are and how well the people can access those destinations. And from there, you can model all sorts of other things like what the economic effect of those trips might be. Uh, so for example, you, if you're, if you're uh, looking at a particular industry, if an economic development professional is looking at a particular industry, uh, say you're looking at doing an incentive for uh, breweries or for bars and restaurants for your uh, hospitality sector, you can model how people can use trails to get to uh, those businesses. And there's a certain ability to say, uh, what the economic effect of increasing that connectivity would be. Um, now that's a little bit complex and it involves a lot of assumptions that, uh, that, that are uh, very data driven. So I wanted to give a simpler version here that even without complex analytics, a community can look at the transportation connectivity benefits of a trail just by looking at things like the number of jobs within a half mile or two miles of a trail, the number of students in schools, the number of car-free households that would be get, getting extra uh, transportation benefit, and the number of households experiencing poverty. Generally, we assume that the walk shed of a trail, a walk shed, people will travel a half mile, a uh, bike shed, people will travel two miles. And you can use GIS tools that are available uh, through the local planning department, even with Google Maps, to support these kind of buffer analyses. And what they let you do is they let you go out and say something that has some, some real data and meat on the bones such as once constructed, the new Southside Trail would serve 165 households in its walk shed, 675 households in its bike shed. And within biking distance, trail users could reach 120 potential jobs, two elementary schools and one middle school. And this is crucial to this community because 30% of households within biking distance of the trail do not own cars. So there's a lot of data there and it makes that value case very clear for how the transportation connectivity of this particular place might be improved. And this is a type of thing that you can really just fill in those numbers using uh, public census data and easily available online tools like Google Maps. And you can have that sort of data driven argument to put in your case for your trail. Now, political value. This is one that uh, often I think we, we, uh, we, we don't talk about because it seems a little crass to go into the decision makers and talk purely about the political value. But it's an attribute that we should really take advantage of. People love trails. Parks and trails consistently rank as the most desired amenity across a broad range of local, regional, and national surveys. You can replicate these surveys. It's fairly easy. You can do uh, door knocking, you can do mailing, you can do survey monkey, you can do social media. Nationally, 47% of people have used a biking, uh, hiking, biking, or walking trail within the past year. But if you go and replicate those surveys about whether people like those trails, the numbers are even higher. And of course, it's always possible that you would uh, conduct a survey like this and, and get uh, different results. But spread your, spread your uh, scope widely. Um, 
remember that local survey tools uh, are available now at a much, much lower cost. So you don't have to just go out and talk to folks who are most likely to be right next door to a project. You can speak to folks who might be further away, who might be interested in the project and, and the larger uh, community effect, and then take the results of that survey to your local decision makers and say, hey, nationally 47% have used this in our community based on these results. 45, 50, 60, whatever your numbers show, percent of people really care about this. It's a tool in your arsenal, especially with things like Facebook and SurveyMonkey now that a lot of us don't, uh, don't think about because it used to be such a difficult process. And then finally, I'm going to just list some of the harder to quantify benefits like the preservation of green space, mental health, transportation safety, community connectivity, and property values. All these are things that we believe that trails are helpful for, and we're continuing to do research to quantify this at the individual level. We're starting to get good research out there, especially about the uh, mental health piece that we've been sort of grasping at for a long time, trying to figure out what the effect of, of having uh, these linear park-like experiences are. Um, property values is one that we're hoping in the next year to be able to come out with some, some strong economic data on what the effect of trails are. Community connectivity, transportation safety, preservation of green space are all things that we, we know intrinsically that trails are, are good for, but how do we quantify that and allocate those benefits in a way that sort of fits in a numerical model? We're, we're working on that as part of our research into practice team here. And I'll put a plug in for my colleague, Torsha Bhattacharya, who's our director of research. She's working on all these things. And I hope that if any of you are also working on those things that you will reach out to her uh, to, to share what you're learning and, and to work together on this. But don't leave these things out just because the numbers are hard. You can use stories, anecdotes, photos, videos. This is where the storytelling piece comes in and the quantification starts to break down. So while we're working on getting the numbers stronger to make the, the value case in a more quantified way, continue doing the storytelling and, and using the anecdotes to make the story strong. So again, that's, sort of, that, that's the summary. Making the value case for trail starts off with looking at the economic effect and using the appropriate assessment tool, asking a few simple questions to your trail users about their hard goods, soft goods, and logic, uh, lodging spending. Running that through an in-plan model, if you're going to use uh, value capture tools to really get that full uh, assessment of the local economy. And then adding on what the economists call the externalities, but what the rest of us in the trail field would probably call the primary benefits of trails for health, for transportation, and for community. And remember to use those stories and visuals of all the hard to quantify benefits. Uh, just because you, you can't count it doesn't mean that you shouldn't use it to uh, in, in empower your community planning. So with that, I'm going to turn things back to Kelly. Great. Thank you, Shane. I thought that I'd quickly give you an example of how we have taken the outcome of one of the direct spending analyses that we've done um, and basically what that outcome looks like. So when you've collected the data and you know what the numbers are after doing the analysis, what does your fact sheet look like? What do, what do your talking points say? Um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about a study that we did on the Mon River Trail System in North Central West Virginia. The Mon River Trail System is a 50 plus mile rail trail network in North Central West Virginia with Morgantown at the center of the network. And Morgantown is a university city um, with approximately 50,000 residents when the students are in town. Somebody can correct me if I'm wrong there, but I think that that's about right. Um, anyways, we've been collecting trail, cap, trail user counts on the Mon River since uh, 2015. And in 2017, we conducted a trail user survey to understand um, the characteristics of the users and to understand what their impact is on the community. We found out that there are more than 200,000 users annually. And you can see here on your screen the impact that that makes to the local communities there. So again, we saw that the annual economic impact falls within that six to nine million dollar range that Shane talked about earlier. 
on the right side of your screen, you can see how we've framed this impact. So the idea is that this fact sheet <clears throat> and these talking points would be used in conversation with local elected officials, um, state elected officials, folks who are making decisions about how investments are made on this trail and how investments are being made to extend this trail and make it an even greater regional asset. So we saw that on average um, tourists, and we're classifying those as people who travel more than 50 miles, spend about $316 per trip while staying in the area. And then we um, multiplied that by four um, to see how, or we calculated the amount that a family of four would have spent during that trip. Um, we see that trail users are spending more than $200 annually on hard goods. And this was really important. Um, we found that bicyclists outspent other trail users on lodging and soft goods. And I'll, I'll talk about why this piece was called out and why it's so important in a second. We also found that most trail use was local and that this trail system is sometimes primarily used by runners and walkers, um, which was something that we thought we might see, but it was affirmed in the, the trail count data and in our trail user survey. Um, so we know that people who are using the trail far exceed the CDC recommendation of um, moderate intensity physical exercise per week. And this is really important in an area that struggles with the obesity epidemic and um, you know, related factors. We also learned that um, trail users find out about the trail mostly through word of mouth. Um, and then this last piece is, is a recommendation to our partners and to the people that our partners are working with on the ground. So strategic investment in trail promotion and marketing is, as a major biking destination could really help increase the local economic impact of the trail. So again, we found that there were more local users than non-local users. Um, we think that given the geographic size of this trail system, and um, the opportunities that are available among it, um, you know, to stay in uh, a place like Morgantown, a kind of mid-sized city, and then travel out to smaller communities. Um, there's, you get kind of a range of experiences there, and it could become a really wonderful trail destination. But we think that there needs to be more investment in that marketing to get more overnight bicyclists to come visit the Monitor Trail System. Also, as part of this study, we um, worked with West Virginia University who conducted a local business survey of local business owners within a uh, one mile radius of the trail in the downtown core. Um, and they found you know, that, there, that local businesses who were very proximate to the trail saw it as a really important asset, um, maybe not necessarily to the, the revenue stream of their business, but they saw it as a, a really important asset to the quality of life that it provides their employees. Um, and out of the study, we got a lot of really great, um, just kind of qualitative information about why, why trails are so important to this particular uh, community. And this is just a quote from one of the business owners there. So often when we think about a trail's value, we are thinking about the revenue that it generates because we think that it's you know, most important to talk about that economic impact. And that's the only way we're gonna be able to um, be able to make the case to the folks who um, hold the, the funding and make decisions about that. Um, and that's really, really important. But really the only way that um, it works is if communities are taking full advantage of their, their trail 
and going beyond, um, you know, just creating places for people who are non-local visitors to stay and eat and, um, and shop. Um, but we also want to be able to create places where the quality of life is great for our, our neighbors and, and residents. But this is an example, um, the picture that you're seeing here is an example of an event that took place on the Mon River Trail system a couple years ago. It was a two-day supported bike ride. So it's, it's bringing in um, you know, locals and non-locals to ride the Mon River Trail system over the course of two days together. Um, the impact, you know, of just those, those two short days uh, into local businesses was nearly $40,000. And we're bringing in people into the community to see what this place looks and feels like, what the quality of life is like there, how the trail really enhances that. And so, again, when we're thinking about things like economic impact and tourism, let's think about it as an enabler of healthy placemaking and not just an economic tool. So that's to say that, you know, that when we are describing and when we are capturing the value that a trail brings, we are able to explain how that economic impact also translates into quality of life for our residents and makes places um, safer and more appealing for people to live, work, and play. So we're seeing it as also a retention and recruitment tool for people who, and new residents who might want to come in and live in a community. And trails are a great way to showcase a community and um, can be that type of recruitment and retention tool as well. So that's just one example of how we are um, using these different types of tools to communicate the value to different audiences. And we'd really like to hear from you now in our last 15 minutes. So I'm just posing these questions to spark conversation, but Eli will let us know if we have some questions already. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you, Shane. And as you can see from that um, final slide, we do have a ton of these resources on making the case for trails and building and managing trails on our website currently and we're always working to improve. So we do take into consideration your feedback, any comments you have um, as we work to make our website better and, and serve you more. And that um, survey that Shane mentioned will live on that build trail section of our website as well. And we'll send that out to you in one of the follow-up emails after this webinar. So as Kelly mentioned, we're moving on to Q&A. We do have a few questions here already, but feel free to to start typing them in that box and we'll get to all the ones we can in these final 15 minutes. But before I start with the content related ones, um, there were a few that were essentially, uh, is this webinar recorded and do can we have access to the slides as well as the recording? And yes, the webinar is being recorded and we will send it out to all attendees and absentees in the follow-up email. And we will also make it available on our YouTube channel and on that build trail section of our website. As for the slides, we normally handle that on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, if you're particularly interested in Kelly's section or Shane's section, I would reach out to each of them individually just to let them know what you plan on doing with them and asking for their okay. And you'll see their contact information on the final slide um, as we conclude our Q&A. So let's dive into these content-related ones. Um, one of the early ones came from Laura Brown, and I believe this is for Shane. And she appears to be with the Connecticut Trail Census at the University of Connecticut. And she says that um, they found a significant source of economic impact uh, occurs due to health impacts. And she's working on a white paper using the health economic assessment tool from the World Health Organization. And she wants to know if we know of anyone working on adapting that tool for US use. Um, and I guess I'll add on, if you're familiar with it, are we using it in any of our work? So it's actually a very, very good comprehensive tool, and um, we have looked at it. Um, 
we actually tried to scope out and assess what it would take for us to uh, specialize that for U.S. work. And basically, for for uh, cost reasons, uh, we ended up not not going that direction. Um, most of RTC's health work focuses on trying to figure out uh, health costs avoided, as that's a metric that appeals to decision makers and sort of has a more uh, understandable quality to folks. And converting the, the world health um, data from the value of statistical life into something that sort of works at this more uh, local level uh, is something that we just decided not to take on. We are, however, uh, updating, uh, working on some new estimates of the total value of the health effects of biking and walking at the national scale that may end up with something fairly close to that. So the direct answer is no, we're not, we're not translating that tool, but we are doing some other research on the total, um, total value of biking and walking in the U.S. that I think you should expect to see early in the, in, in the coming year um, that, that may match up in a useful way. Great, thank you. And here's another question. I think this one um, is for both Kelly and Shane. Um, and it's from Catherine Breyers. She says she's heard that 50 miles is the threshold that a trail should surpass to see significant economic benefits. What are your thoughts on that as a threshold? And how do you assess benefits of shorter than 50 mile trail, trail networks? Well, I'm just thinking of an example um, uh, that I included in my slides of the of the Swamp Rabbit Trail in Greenville, South Carolina. And that is a about a 20 mile trail, I believe. And if anybody tie or if anybody from from Greenville is on the line, you can chime in here. But I know that um, they're they they see a pretty significant economic impact. I I think also reaching up to that six million annual um so you know there's an example of a of a single trail that is less than 50 miles that sees that i know that their hospital obviously invests in the trail and the county um or the city parks and rec department is really amazing and they've got um strong programs um that support you know local trail use and then probably bring in non-locals for events so I think, you know, there, and, and I, our experience across the country is that even shorter trails um, that might be in, in denser populated areas that do a really excellent job of promoting, programming their trail can probably see the same amount of economic impact. And, and I think that there's also some difference in how different fields assess these things. If you're doing a study from the tourism standpoint to be published in the tourism related literature, then a lot of times you'll get numbers like the 50 miles because that's uh, sort of viewed as what it takes to be a destination trail that's going to attract uh, attract folks from other areas to come spend there. Um, but as Kelly said, the, the intrinsic benefits to the community also aggregate up that make many shorter trails also meaningful. It's just a matter of what you're counting. Um, you know, the, the, the health effects are essentially calculated uh, per mile. And some of those can be massive, massive numbers in a, in a trail sense um, that provide benefits even at the, at the shortest scale. So um, I would say from a tourism standpoint, uh, there's probably some validity to that idea that you need to have enough of a destination to make it worth someone traveling to spend their money and, and injected into a community from outside, but the intrinsic benefits are also significant. Great, thank you both. Um, and I have a question here from Bob Mueller. Um, it's also a similar um, one that I've seen from a couple other people. And um, essentially it's, can you use these models um, for trails not yet built, for planned trails? How, I guess, how would you assess the, the economic value and communicate those? Uh, benefits to decision makers. You can, and essentially what you would do is you would use uh, comparables. Uh, you would sort of look through and, and try to find the closest available analog to your trail. Um, we have worked uh, extensively on trying to uh, model and estimate the um, projected usage of trails, and on our website uh, at the link that Eli has already already shared out there, there there is a tool that helps to uh, predict future trail uh, usage. 
Uh, and then the economic modeling, you would essentially plug in into the implant model, the assumptions for your community. And, and as I said, that's, that's uh, a little bit difficult um, because all of the different industry factors and local conditions have to be plugged in there. So for direct spending analysis, I would say uh, because there's such a wealth of spending analyses sort of out in the world, you might do best just to look for a comparable spending analysis and then uh, sort of decide whether you think, uh, you know, is, is your community uniquely uh, better or worse in some things that would justify giving you sort of a ballpark number. Um, but then on the implant model, if you wanted to go that route, you would really dial it in locally based on the usage numbers and the economic characteristics of your community. Okay, and Craig Shanklin um, asks if we have a good resource for trail counters or, or a recommendation for, um, I, I don't know if we wanna get into vendors, but we can talk about types of trail counts um, and um, perhaps types of trail counters as well, what works best to, to get the inputs for these economic models. Well, I just wanna emphasize that it really, uh, having good counts matters, but the mechanism from an economic standpoint doesn't matter that much. So it's what your willingness to spend, what your willingness to maintain, um, there are there are folks at RTC that can go into incredible detail about counters and the pros and cons of different counting systems and matrices. Um, when we were trying to figure out how to project trail usage based on a bunch of uh, statistical factors, we really had to go into the weeds and have really, really detailed, valid, cross-referenceable results on that. For these economic purposes, um, you want to have good numbers, but you really just need to have a basic count. So uh, having a $5,000 uh, laser counter sitting out there for years isn't going to make that much of a difference from having a volunteer with a clicker. Um, so I'm all for having good counts. I think there are a lot of things that communities can learn from having good count data as part of a monitoring and assessment program to see how your trails are working. So don't take that as discouragement from really investing in, in a modeling and count program. But for the narrow purposes of, of this, uh, I also don't want to discourage anybody from getting a baseline direct spending assessment because they don't want to spend a bunch on a counter. It works at all scales. Yeah, and we, we have experiences with different types of counters, um, you know, kind of ranging in technological complexity, right? Like Shane said, um, we've used some infrared counters that simply track every individual user. We know of infrared counters that include an inductive loop in the trail surface that can help differentiate between pedestrians and bicyclists. So, you know, when you get a little more sophistication, I mean, maybe in the technology or just in the methodology of the way you're counting to do things like differentiate between user type, then you can also do things like that, like say, well, we know that there are more bicyclists or more pedestrians using the trail. How does that impact kind of the, um, the um, spending to the local businesses nearby. Um, so I think that there are lots of ways to do that and lots of ways to get short duration counts um, to, to project what your annual use might be. Exactly, there, there are a lot of different methods. The, the only caveat that I would really give on counting is um, don't outsmart yourself and uh, do something that relies on a simplifying technology that might leave some people out. Um, they're, they're um, you know, counting takes some time or it takes some resources. Uh, don't necessarily outsource that to something like a Bluetooth technology or to uh, some sort of a, a requirement that it'll only track people who have their cell phones on or, um, you know, something that only counts uh, bike users on a heat map who have turned on an app. Um, if you're going to be using public dollars and public for, for public investment, um, it is important to make sure that you're counting everyone, not just the folks that are uh, using whatever technological uh, development comes next. And, and um, that's not to disparage any of those methods. I think they're all very helpful and they're all improving uh, in their inclusiveness very intentionally because this has been a, a constant criticism of, of some of those types of things. Um, but really it's important to make sure that you're including everyone, including the folks that you may not uh, assume are your trail users. If you have a particular type of user in mind and then only count that user, uh, 
uh, you're you're uh, disqualifying a bunch of folks uh, in a way that is uh, inequitable and bad for your data. Great. And I'm going to paraphrase a question we've received from Don Rose, um, and it's essentially you you can do all this work to get all the great benefits of your trail and start to make the case. Um, to decision makers and the public for investment, but you'll also uh, run into negative uh, arguments from adjacent landowners or others who may argue that the trail will increase crime or 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 something else, some other negative benefit. So, do you have any suggestions for countering those arguments? Yeah. So, I mean, I think that that comes with the always hard work of making sure that you are really inclusive in your planning from the beginning and you know that you are reaching out to adjacent landowners who might have these concerns and including them in the process from from the beginning um, I don't think that there's necessarily a uh, a silver bullet here in terms of um, what you can say to change people's minds. I think it's something that they have to see over time, and that can happen in in the the planning of a trail and in the way that um, they could be included. I mean, we've got all the information about how trails increase property values, and that can be good or bad depending on on where you are. Um, so I think that um, there, there are, are some other tools that we have in our toolbox that kind of get at um, how you can work with opposition. Um, and Shane, did you have something to add to that? Oh, I think that's just that's right on. I would just say also use your data. Um, most places, especially on the crime argument, it's very difficult to sort of figure out how you would assess a research survey over a national scale of the effects of trails on crime. There's just a lot of a lot of data and a lot of variance over place, and it's going to be very uh, very squirrely to try and scope something at that scale. But if you're working locally, normally your crime data is is uh, something that is is accessible and publicly available, or at least could be gotten by FOIA. And you can literally take your trail and compare it to the adjacent area a couple blocks over, and you can see if there is crime associated with the trail. Um, so again, you can find a comparable community, a comparable trail, and, and, and really look. Um, now, in most cases, you want to make sure that you keep your baseline to be the similar neighborhood, um, because I don't think any reasonable person would argue that there's no crime on trails, but generally in the places that we've looked, the crime on trail is at or below the baseline level of the community that it goes through. And thanks, Shane. I, I also um, think that in working, you know, if you're talking about a project trail and you're you're working with those community members and you're making sure that they're heard and recognized, and while planning for the design and construction of the trail, you're also addressing ways to um, you know, create trail patrols or community ambassadors or, you know, to, to even get law enforcement on the trail on a regular basis. Um, you know, I think that that's kind of more in that um, kind of programmatic and, and supporting the trail and its users. Um, but, it, you know, there, there are lots of ways of, of doing it, but it's just stressing the importance of making sure that the opponents are included in the conversation. Great, and we are reaching the end here, but hopefully this will be a, a very quick answer from Shane. Jeff Steele asks if we invite people on this webinar and other trail professionals to use our trail survey question. Yes, absolutely. I invite you to not only use the questions, but share the results back with us so that we can uh, keep uh, as, as much data as we can uh, from these sorts of things. We're not sure what that will add up to, um, but if all of us on this call are asking the same survey questions, that just builds a greater wealth of data uh, that we can use to inform our research in the future. Excellent, and I think we can call this a wrap. There are a few more questions we didn't get to, but I will forward those on to Kelly and Shane, um, or both of them, depending on the nature of the question. Um, and we'll hopefully be able to respond to those by the end of next week. Um, you'll see our contact information on the screen in front of you. 
any um, again any unanswered questions can go to Shane or Kelly directly or to me and I can filter those out um, we invite you to forward that sign on link for the trail expert network you see at the bottom of the slide onto any trail professionals you think could benefit from attending these webinars and from the other resources we send out I want to thank everyone for your attendance and participation I hope you found this presentation informative and useful as you continue to develop, manage, and promote your trails and trail networks. And again, you'll be receiving a follow-up email shortly after this webinar with a link to the recording and a feedback survey. And we would really, really appreciate it if you would take the time to fill it out as it helps inform our future webinar topics. And with that, thanks again, everyone, for attending. I hope you join us for another webinar in the near future.